Well, welcome to all of you to uh, our evening of archaeology, and we're going to begin tonight, and we're going to continue through all day tomorrow. So tonight we're talking about digging in King Solomon's ruins, which I think is going to be really interesting. I don't know about you. I have an idea that you're all here because you're curious about archaeology just like I am. It's wonderful to see how the past comes alive and just reiterates some of the truth and the the validity of scripture to me as we see some of the archaeological finds. I think we're going to really enjoy that. So welcome, and I'm glad that you're all here. I do want to let you know that tomorrow is going to be a fairly busy day uh, for presentations. So Dr. Yonker is going to be presenting at 9.30 in the morning at 11, uh, immediately following potluck. So we're going to feed you. So 1.30-ish, you know, depending on what time we get everything packed up and done eating. So uh, after that, and then we're going to take a little bit of a break, and we're going to be back here in the evening at 6.30 uh, for a Vespers. One of those topics tomorrow is going to be on Noah's Ark. I, I don't want to tell you when, because I want you to hear all four, right? <laughs> but it, to, tomorrow, one of the, tomorrow's topics is going to be on Noah's Ark. And I believe I will have to tell you because I know. I think it's going to be the 11 o'clock hour. So if you have friends and neighbors and family in the area, call them up tonight and tell them, hey, if you want to hear a little bit more about Noah's Ark and where they found it, uh, they need to be here tomorrow morning at 11 o'clock. So praise the Lord. We're here together. We're going to have a word of prayer. And then I'm going to ask Denzel to come up and introduce our speaker. So why don't you all take a moment, bow your heads with me as we ask the Lord to be with us here tonight. Father in heaven, I just want to thank you that we have an opportunity to come together to hear, Lord, knowledge that speaks to us from the past. Lord, that is going to help us understand how true the Bible really is and to maybe give us a better picture of some of the stories we read in Scripture. And I just pray that your spirit would be here with us tonight, Lord, that we would be encouraged not only in faith, but encouraged in our confidence in your word, knowing that you have had your hand upon your people throughout all of time. And we pray, according to the promise of your word, that you will be here with us tonight, for we gather in Jesus' name, and we know that you will be here in our midst. And so we thank you. We pray that you would give our speaker the words to speak and give him the strength after his travels. And we just thank you for being here with all of us tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Denzel? It's my privilege to introduce to you our speaker this evening and tomorrow, Dr. Randy Yonker, who is the uh, head of archaeology for Andrews University and uh, for our church. And he has been very uh, uh, world-renowned in his uh, archaeology and, and what he does for our church in, uh, in proving the Bible and that it's real and uh, through, through archaeology. But I tell you, it's really appreciated appreciate it is that I've had the privilege of going on two trips with him uh, and I will tell you he, he is well known because of uh, when we go into these places he knows the people already there they they give us special treatment because we're with Dr. Yonker and we're able to go places that no one else can go because we're with Dr. Yonker and uh, so it's really a privilege that Dodd Center we're really blessed to have be able to have Dr. Yonker come here He's a world-renowned speaker. He travels extensively. He just got back from a trip. He's getting ready to go on another trip uh, within a couple of weeks. So he's in between trips coming to, to Dodd Center to talk to us. And so, uh, Dr. Yonker, welcome, and thank you for being here in uh, the Dodd Center Church. Thank you. I had my coat on, but I see it's a little warmish in here, and I'm going to be very warm in about 15 minutes, so I'm taking it off ahead of time. So it looks like you're in a similar dress mode. Being a field archaeologist, I'm used to actually wearing clothes for the outdoor work, so, so we'll kind of uh, adopt that uh, stance here. Um, as Denzel was saying, we, we had a couple of wonderful trips together. I've been a field archaeologist since 1979, I guess, is when I first went into... Uh, the field. Uh, I'll tell part of that story more tomorrow, how I got into archaeology. It's a very strange and interesting thing. I think God was opening up some very interesting doors. But uh, I started working in Israel. I worked there for about six summers, long summers. Our dig seasons last about two months in those days. You get up at 
4, 4.30 in the morning. We were talking about getting up early here, and I, I'm sure a lot of you are used to those morning hours, but we like to get out before the sun's up for a couple of reasons. It's cooler to work in the morning hours before the sun starts really getting hot in the Middle East. Uh, by about 1 o'clock, you want to get out of the sun and back uh, into your camp where it's a little cooler. And so we'll have a breakfast at, say, 4.30 in the morning, get up at 4, have breakfast at 4.30. We're at the site by 5 before the sun comes up. We take pictures while the light is, you know, the sunlight is not quite directly on us to cast shadows, but there's enough light we can take photographs. So we do our photography, then we start digging. We'll excavate until about 9.30 in the morning. Then we have what's called second breakfast. We had a 4.30 breakfast, and we have a 9.30 second breakfast. And then we'll continue working in the sun until about 1, 1.30, thereabouts. Then we go in for our lunch, and then we'll take a shower, rest, and so forth. And then you're back doing lab work in the afternoon uh, in the buildings, usually, or a tent, wherever we have it set up. And we keep going until supper time around 6, 6.30. Sometimes there's what they call the British system, tea. They'll have something to drink and snacks uh, about 4 in the afternoon. So we eat about five times a day. But we're burning off enough calories. That's not a real problem. So, uh, so we're working hard, eating a lot, and uh, having quite an exciting time. So that's a typical dig. I started off in Israel for about six years. I've been working in the Hashemite kingdom of Jordan just to the east of Israel. That would be biblical Jordan. I've been there for over 30 years. And in addition to that, we have a project going. Uh, those are Old Testament sites, by the way. We're working in Israel. Uh, this was one of our projects in Israel, working at a site west of Jerusalem called Gezer. It was one of the major cities of King Solomon and King David's time, particularly Solomon, as you'll see. And I also worked at one of Solomon's provincial capitals near Mount Carmel, where the Elijah prophets, you know, Elijah had the, con uh, the uh, encounter with the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. I actually stayed in a camp at the foot of Mount Carmel for about five summers. And then over in uh, Jordan, we're working south of the capital city of the Ammonites, Ammon, uh, near the town of Madaba. These are all places mentioned in the Bible. Uh, some of our team worked at Heshbon, which the Israelites conquered before going to Jericho. You've all heard about Jericho. And so we've worked there for many years. We're still working there, and we're working at related sites, all connected to the biblical stories. And then in Sicily, we started a project there working in the Christian period, because this is all Old Testament stuff. And in Sicily, we just uh, uh, published a book about our last eight summers working in a, the earliest Christian church ever built in Sicily. And that was exciting. There's a whole cemetery there. We've been digging what they call the necropolis, finding out what the people wore, what they were bur buried with, you know, the women, things that they were wearing and so forth. And we learn a lot about the people. We learn a lot about their art, their theology, because it's reflected in their mosaics and the frescoes and the jewelry that they had and so forth. And then we've been working in, uh, see, that was Sicily, Cyprus, and another Christian site. And our most recent work, as was already alluded to, we started about five years ago uh, doing research on Mount Ararat, actually. And that's been a very exciting thing. Uh, we were told a few years back that some of the local Kurdish guides, the Kurds are a people that live in the eastern part of Turkey, and uh, they take people up to climb this mountain all the time. It's the tallest mountain in the Middle East. It's nearly 17,000 feet high. It's so high that you don't have much oxygen up there. You get about 10,000 feet and you start feeling a little funny. You have to get used to working with little air. But we were told that they had found on the side of Mount Ararat a big wood debris flow. And of course, people started asking, well, what would cause all this wood to be up there? And people naturally think of the ark. And uh, we're going to tell you about that story tomorrow. We've, I've made two climbs at Mount Ararat myself. We have a team of geologists and archeologists and photographers. We're going back in two weeks we're going to have a conference with Turkish archaeologists and scholars, and then we're going to have another climb up the mountain and continue our digital recording and mapping of the mountain. So we'll have more to report after two weeks. But I'm here today, so I'll tell you what we know so far, uh, at least tomorrow. So that kind of gives you an idea of what I've been doing nearly 40 years, field archaeology, and I've, I've been privileged working with some of the world's top archaeologists. I'm a member of a society where we report these things about a 1,000, 1,500 scholars will meet at different American cities and talk about our research. And Andrews University has been very involved with biblical archaeology, going back to 1967, I think it was, when Siegfried Horn, uh, my predecessor, a couple of 
predecessors back. He started the archaeology program at the seminary so that uh, young men and women learning how to go into ministry would have some idea of the historical archaeological context for the Bible stories. And in a day and age, I'm sure you've heard that there's a lot of people out there that doubt the uh, validity, they doubt the truthfulness of the Bible. The historical stories seem to them too fantastic, and so they cast a lot of doubt upon that. And yet archaeology continually is finding artifacts that correlate. We find the names of biblical people, we find the names of biblical cities, and we find the residue of biblical events that indicate that whoever wrote the Bible, Moses and the prophets and so forth, they seem to know what they were talking about. When they talk about people, and they talk about events, they talk about places, we're finding those archaeologically, and the events seem to line up with biblical chronology in a rather dramatic way. And each year, more discoveries are being made so that more pieces of the Bible story are uh, being you know, fit, uh, fitted together, so to speak. So what I'm going to do this evening, uh, you'll have to forgive me, I'm programmed. When I stand in front of a group of people, my classes last two hours. So I'm not going to do that to you tonight. What I'm going to have to do is put this on fast forward a little bit, but I will give you a taste of uh, what we did in uh, a summer at this important site of Gezer. I'll read the Bible text, and I'm going to explain what we actually did. This was a very controversial site. Uh, many skeptics of the Bible said that the stories about Gezer are not true, and we actually went into the field and uh, did some excavation there and were able to find some things that confirmed that the biblical accounts of what happened to Gezer actually did happen. It was rather exciting. We had many famous archaeologists watching us that summer. We had many visitors from different universities. It was quite an exciting time. So you're going to get a little taste of what it's like to go into the field, uh, have certain goals, what it's like to excavate a site like this, what kind of evidence do we look for, and uh, how can we actually correlate what we're digging up out of the ground with what the Bible text is actually saying. That's what biblical archaeology is all about. So I'm going to take you on one of these adventures we had. I was a young student at the time when I started this project. I was working on my Ph.D. in archaeology with a world-famous William G. Deaver. My professor now, he's just about 90 years old. He's still alive, but uh, he was much younger, of course, back in uh, 1990. That was uh, over 30 years ago now. And uh, we had quite an exciting time. But he was sort of a biblical skeptic when he came. In fact, some of my uh, colleagues called him the Dark Prince of biblical archaeology. He didn't even like the word biblical archaeology. He said we should just call it Syro-Palestinian archaeology. But he worked with a number of us who are believers and our discoveries and subsequent events have made him open to the fact there is a real biblical archaeology and he's changed his attitude a little bit because of our work together I think. So anyway I'm going to share with you what it's like to go on one of these digs. Um, I'll try and not take too long telling the story. You're looking at a picture I suppose I should hang on to this so I can change the pictures. Uh, this is an aerial photograph looking to the east towards Jerusalem of our archaeological site. It's called Tel Gezer. The word Tel in Hebrew and Arabic means uh, a hill full of formerly <laughs> occupied ruins, okay? Buried cities, if you will. And this particular hill above the yellow letters, there's some 26 cities buried on top of each other, going all the way back to a couple thousand years before Jesus, or more. We call it the early Bronze Age, time of Abraham, to give you an idea. And it was occupied during the time of Joshua, when the Israelites conquered the Promised Land. Uh, that would be just after the time of Moses. It was occupied during the time of Solomon, King Solomon of the Bible. This is at, the site's mentioned in the Bible many times, and it continued to be occupied during the time of Queen Esther. So it gives you an idea. All these cities are buried different time periods on top of each other. When we're digging down through, we can see the floors change. We can see the change of the walls. And one of the key things that help us know what time period we are in is the pottery. Because everybody, they didn't have plastic and they didn't have china quite yet at that time. They made all of their pots. Their cooking pots, their plates, their cups, their saucers were all made out of clay. They would bake the clay. But they changed their style about every 10, 20, 30 years, just like today. We don't wear the same clothes today we like to wear 50 years ago. Our cars look quite different from 50 years ago. And our shoes, everything's a little bit different. We call that material culture. And ancient people, they changed their clothes. They changed their jewelry. They changed their pots, particularly their pots. And so every 50 years, we can look at the pot, and the shape and the paint design on the pots changed to whatever is more stylish. And so we can say, wow, this pot was made 200 years after Jesus. 
this pot was made 200 years before Jesus and so forth. So we uh, learn how to tell the difference in these pottery styles. And people, when they would break a dish in antiquity, they would just leave it on the floor of the house. And so uh, through the literally hundreds of years, you'll find as you're going down through the different floor levels, going deeper into earlier and earlier houses and buildings, you'll find pieces of the pottery that they left behind. And we can then date the building room we're in or the wall that the pot's next to by looking at the pottery. And that's going to be important for our story today. For you guys that want to become archaeologists, you've got to know the pottery, okay? So if you can learn to master that, you'll become a good archaeologist. So that's one of the things we'll be looking at. So there had been a controversy about this city. Um, my professor, Bill Deaver, uh, he claimed that uh, he had found, when he was a young archaeologist back in the 60s, he had found evidence of a city gate from the time of King Solomon. And he was very proud of that. Even though he became skeptical about the Bible, he always thought that was true. There was a Solomon, and he had found Solomon's palace and Solomon's gateway at the city of Gezer. The Bible talks about that, as you'll see in a moment. But some skeptics came along and said that he was really a secret Christian, a conservative, you know, and he, he was called really a fundamentalist Christian, and he was hiding his true faith. And he said, well, that's not true. And they argued with him. They said, the only reason you think you found King Solomon's ruins is because you believe in the Bible. And he says, no, it has nothing to do with the Bible. That just happens to be what I found. And so they had a big argument. So he talked to us in my class one day about this. He said, really, somebody needs to go back. I dug it in the 60s. It's now uh, almost 1980. I'm sorry, 1990, that was 30 years later, 25 years later, and he said, we probably should go back and um, redig this site and prove what I thought I had found 30 years before. So that's how this got going. Well, we were all thinking, hey, that would be fun. Dr. Deaver was getting older, and we didn't think he'd ever go dig again in the field, and so I asked him, would you be willing to go? You know, you said this should be done. Why don't you go ahead and do it? And he said, well, it costs too much money. And I said, well, how much would it cost? He said, $40,000 for the summer. Now, that's not too much now, but back then, it was quite a bit of money. And uh, to pay for all the, you know, the equipment and all the food and the lodging for your team and all of that. So uh, he said, I'll tell you what, Randy, if you can find $40,000, I'll go back into the field. He said, in fact, I'll tell you what, you find half of it. You find $20,000. And I will get the other 20, and then I'll take all the students, and we'll have a dig in Israel at Gezer. So that's what happened, actually. This is <laughs> the true story. I don't know if you've heard this part or not, but I w uh, at the time, I was working for Andrews University, but I was working my PhD at University of Arizona. My boss at that time was a dean of the seminary called Gerhard Hausel, Dr. Gerhard Hausel. Some of you will know him. Great stalwart for the Bible. And he was my boss, so I called up Dr. Hausel from Arizona, and I said, Dr. Hauser, we have a great opportunity. We can take Andrews University students with University of Arizona students and do a dig with the famous Dr. Deaver. But there's one thing that I need. And he said, well, what's that? I said, I need $20,000. <laughs> now, that's a lot of money for a, a seminary. And he said, wow. He said, I'll tell you what, though. Um, give me a few minutes. I'm going to make a couple phone calls. That surprised me because I thought he'd say, well, Randy, we just don't have that kind of money. We can't do the dig. So I... Uh, I hung up, and he called me back about 10 or 15 minutes later at my house, and he said, Randy, I've got your $20,000. I said, how did you do that? Well, he had a friend that makes cookies down in Southern Adventist University, and he told this man about this, and he says, okay, I'll send up $20,000. So I had the pleasure of calling my professor, Deaver, back. This is only a half hour later. He says, you find $20,000, and I'll go on a dig with you. I'll get the other twenty. So I said, well, I've got my 20. Where's yours? <laughs> and he was very surprised. He said, how did you do that? I said, well, I have, the dean has a friend who was able to contribute the money. So he said, okay. Well, he had friends at the National Geographic Society. You've all heard of National G, right? They make all these nice films, and they make the magazines with the yellow border around it. So he had friends there. He was very well known. He told them what had happened. He says, we need to go back and dig Gezer. It's a famous Bible site. I need $20,000 from you. And the National Geographic gave him the other half of the money. So with the money in hand, we then started our archaeological excavation in 1990 at this site of Gezer. Now, the controversy about whether Solomon was there or not was big at the time. Scholars were arguing about it. They were writing articles against each other. Another piece of the story was that the Bible says Joshua conquered Gezer, and they didn't believe that happened. So we were looking for two things, simple things. Was there any evidence that Joshua could have conquered the city around 1400 B.C.? That's according to the Bible chronology. And was there any evidence that Solomon built Gezer in the 10th century B.C.? 
Those are two simple questions, but that's what everyone was challenging us on. So we went there with that background. So I will now show you some of the pictures and tell the story kind of has it and uh, developed. I was a young PhD student at Bill Deaver. Because I got the money for him, I became the assistant director to the project. <laughs> so I had the famous Bill Deaver as the director, and I was his assistant director. And so I knew this was a great opportunity, and I, I was in charge of part of the excavation. He was doing half of it, and I would do the other half. But I kept my camera around my shoulder all the time. So these are the old-fashioned 35 millimeter, you know, single reflex lens kind of a thing. And I thought, I'm going to take a picture of everything that goes on. Not just the dig. Of course, we were taking pictures of the excavation progress and the artifact. But a lot of famous people were coming to visit it, and I took pictures of everything that happened. So you're going to get to see some of those firsthand pictures of this rather exciting archaeological adventure here. I keep forgetting I got this neat modern technological advice. I don't have to stand up here and change that. So where is Gezer, first of all? So we have a map, and on this map, let's see if I can get this little green thing to work. Whoops, that changed the picture. It just disappeared. I think I, here we go. Okay, Gezer is, uh, you can't see it here, but it's kind of uh, the border between the orange and the green. I think my next picture will show better. But I have a couple pictures, so we'll get up to that. Uh, Joshua 10.33 gives us one of the verses. Let's back up here. It says, in the Bible, the king of Gezer organized the Canaanites versus Joshua and the Israelites. They were going to have a big battle at Gezer. The Bible talks about it. Gezer was in the tribal territory of the tribe of Ephraim. Ephraim. It later became a city of refuge for the Levites. And Gezer, we are told in the Bible, this is very important, was given to King Solomon, has a gift. And the Bible tells us that Solomon then fortified the city of Gezer. Now, archaeologists, when they read these kinds of passages, most of us are reading the Bible for God's power and his grace and his mercy and salvation. But I have to admit, archaeologists add a little bit of different interest. When we see that a king built something or a king destroyed something, we get excited because building a city is something we can find archaeologically. Burning a city is something we can find archaeologically. If we can find the pottery that goes with the building and the burning, we can then correlate that with a biblical story. So we get excited when we hear about destruction in the Bible. That sounds terrible, but we get very excited because we can find that archaeologically. So here's one of our texts, Joshua 10, 33. It says, Then Horam, the king of Gezer, came up to help Lachish, and Joshua killed him, smote him. This is a good old King James Version. Smote him and his people until he had left none remaining. So this is the king of Gezer. They tried to go up against the Israelites, and Joshua killed uh, the king and his men. Now we have another passage that talks about Gezer. It's in 1 Kings 9, 15 to 17. This is a very important Bible text. It uh, says, now this is the account of the forced labor which King Solomon levied to build the house of the Lord. King Solomon, you may remember, his father David was not permitted to build a temple to God, Yahweh God, in Jerusalem because he killed too many people, too much blood on his hands. And so God told David, your son Solomon will get to build the temple to me. And so Solomon built it. It says, but he had to raise taxes. Levy means he was charging the people taxes. And the way you paid your taxes in Bible times, sometimes with money or, you know, valuable things, sometimes with work. They call that corvée work. You come and you work for the king for so much. Samuel, the prophet, warned the Israelites, if you have a king, he's going to make you go and work for him. And that's what Solomon did. He had the people come and build for him his own palace and the temple of the Lord, the house of the Lord, it would be called. Then a uh, supporting structure for Jerusalem called the Milo. Then the city wall around Jerusalem. So Solomon is building a lot of things. His palace, the temple to God, the wall of Jerusalem. And then it says three cities that Solomon wanted to rebuild. And the first one is called Hatsor. That's the most important big city in the north of Israel. It's north of the Sea of Galilee today. Very important city. In fact, the Bible says it was the head of all those cities, all those kingdoms in uh, the time of the uh, judges. Then you have the second city called Megiddo. Megiddo is associated with Armageddon. It's a very famous city in the center of Israel. And it's said that the last battle before the Lord comes will be fought at Megiddo. Some people think that's a literal battle. Other people think it's a metaphorical battle. There's no doubt that Megiddo is a place where people fought a lot of wars throughout history. It's the middle of the country, and it seems like everybody meets there and they fight each other. Then the third city, which is the subject of our our focus tonight is Gezer. And about Gezer, it goes on and adds some additional information. It says that the Pharaoh, king of Egypt, had gone up to Gezer, had captured it, 
burned it. That's where the archaeologist gets interest. I burned Gezer. We can see that archaeologically. Then it says, after burning it with fire, he killed all the Canaanites who lived in the city. The Israelites should have occupied Gezer in the time of Joshua, but they didn't. One of the things that the Israelites failed to do after having this wonderful conquest, they failed to occupy the land. And God said, when you conquered it, you're supposed to keep it. But instead, the Israelites ran off and hid in the hills, and the Egyptians and the Canaanites came back and reoccupied the city, and they had to reconquer them 200 years later. So, but in this case, it was the Egyptian pharaoh that conquered Gezer. Now, Gezer happens to be on the border with Solomon's kingdom of Israel. It's on the Philistine plain right as you move into the hills into Israel. The Canaanites are living in the city. So in a way, Solomon would like to have had that city. The Egyptian pharaoh knew that, and he decided he'd conquer it for himself. But something strange happens because it says that the pharaoh gave, after killing the Canaanites, burning the city, he gives the city as a dowry for his pharaoh's daughter, Solomon's wife. Now, this is very interesting. One of the things Solomon is famous for is that he had a lot of wives. In Bible times, this wasn't a biblical practice, but in the ancient Near East, it was very common to make political alliances by marrying the daughters of other kings. And Solomon was a very good diplomat, apparently, because he had a lot of wives. He made a lot of political alliances. What's unusual about this, though, what a lot of people don't realize, was that even in Bible times, you could marry a lot of kings' daughters easily. But the Egyptian pharaohs did not like to marry their daughters, their princesses, off to foreign kings because they felt they were divine. The Egyptians were divine people. The daughter of a pharaoh would be like a goddess, and she would be too good for a common king to marry. So the fact that pharaoh offers his princess, Egyptian princess, daughter to Solomon is very unusual. That means Solomon apparently was more powerful than the pharaoh thought. And when he conquered Gezer and burned it, Solomon must have said something. The Bible doesn't tell us what he said, but he said, you're not taking that city. If you do, there's going to be consequences. Apparently, it scared the Pharaoh enough that he said, I'll make an alliance with you. I'm going to seal the alliance by giving you my daughter. And in addition to that, I'm going to give you the city I just conquered and burned. How do you like that for a wedding gift, a burnt city? Okay, but that's what Solomon got. But he knew the city was important, and now that the Canaanites were out of the way, he determined to rebuild it and make it one of the best cities. It would be his southern most important city. He would have a big city at Hatzor in the north, uh, Megiddo in the center of his kingdom, and Gezer in the south. So these were all important cities. And he spends more time on Gezer. This little story about the pharaoh is added. And so it says Solomon rebuilt Gezer, and then another place, Laura Beth Horon. So uh, we're going to look at the evidence for Gezer. Now, did that really happen? Is this story true? It gets burnt it gets built, it, and you'll find out it'll get burned again by, uh, after Solomon dies, his son Rehoboam messes up the kingdom of Judah, and another pharaoh comes up and burns it again. So poor Gezer got kicked around, sort of like Ukraine or Poland or some of those countries in modern times. Everybody likes to conquer them because they're in the way. Well, Gezer had the same kind of a history of always getting beat up. But we can find evidence of these buildings and burnings and so forth very easily in archaeology. So here's where Gezer is located. You can see the... Um, I'm afraid it, let's see if it's this. Yeah, here we go. I don't know if you can see my little green light, but the Dead Sea here. A Jerusalem, Mount of Olives right there. If you can see that green thing moving around. And here's where Gezer is, where that little pin is located on the map. Here's a view of how it looked when uh, Deaver dug it originally in the 1960s. This is a, um, let's see if I can hit that again. The ancient city is this area here. There were several walls built at different time periods. These white squares are where they put the tents for the archaeologists. Uh, the white building is their laboratory they built. Not quite as fancy as the one for the dinosaurs, I guess. It was just kind of a pole roofed, as you were mentioning. We were talking about that. And here's some of the excavation squares here. And uh, it turns out that the city had been originally dug by a British fellow back before World War I. Uh, here's a view in uh, the 1980s, just before we would work there at Gezer. And uh, then a close-up here. Some interesting things were found at Gezer. For example, whoops, I did that again. Uh, right here, those white things, you might see them as roads. These were used by the Israeli army before we came to the site. Gezer's on the border with today's Palestine. 
and the Israelis and the Palestinians don't always get along, and so uh, the Israelis were patrolling this, so we had Israeli soldiers around where we were working at the site. It's one of the exciting things about doing archaeology in the Middle East. The nice thing about being an archaeologist is if anybody starts shooting, you just dig your hole a little deeper. Okay, keep your head below all the activity. So this, though, these white things are big stones, probably 12 feet high, and these were representing Canaanite gods or tribes that were being worshipped by the Canaanites before the city was taken over by the Israelites. So we actually found evidence of some of the Canaanite gods in the uh, excavations there. Here's a view of Gezer from the southwest. And again, remember that uh, this mound up here, this is the ancient Tel. There's Israeli uh, vineyards around, and there's 26 cities buried on top of each other. We have to dig down to the right level, of course. Uh, let's see, next picture here. How do we know this is biblical Gezer? Well, the ancient people were very kind. They wrote the name of the city on stones and left the stones all around the boundary of Gezer. So we have no doubt they were digging in the right city. They say, welcome to Gezer. Well, not quite that. They say boundary of Gezer is what they actually say in different languages. Uh, and here's some of the, uh, this is a map that shows where some of these boundary stones have been found around the ancient city. So we have no doubt that we're in the right place. Now, <clears throat> here's the setup for our story. Every good story has to have a setup. This man here with the mustache and the pipe, he clearly looks like an archaeologist. A real archaeologist has to have a pipe, unless you're an Adventist archaeologist. Then we don't smoke a pipe. We chew bubble gum instead, okay? But he, he was a very famous man. Yagil Yadin was his name. I got to meet him in person, actually, uh, because he was directing, supposed to direct a different site when I first learned about archaeology. Mount Carmel area, but he uh, not only was a professor and an archaeologist, he was a soldier in the Israeli army. He'd become a general, and when they were fighting the Palestinians, he was leading some of the army against the Palestinians during the Israeli-Palestinian war. So he was a general, he was a scholar, and during the time of, um, I'm trying to think of the prime minister, Menachem Begin, and Jimmy Carter was the president of the United States, and Anwar Sadat was the president of Egypt. They were able to make the first peace treaty in literally thousand, a couple thousand years, just about, between Israel and Egypt. President Carter was negotiating it, and Menachem Begin and Anwar Sadat met in person. And the assistant, or the deputy prime minister, was Yagil Yadin. And he's the one that actually did the negotiations with the Egyptians to make a peace treaty between modern Israel and modern Egypt. And for that reason, this man did not come to my dig. He was supposed to be there to direct us, and he gave it to one of his assistants. But he did come by, and I got his autograph on one of his books. So, but he was a very, very famous archaeologist. He was a scholar, statesman, and a soldier. All three big things that men like to aspire to, I guess, in life. So he had been working before the Camp David thing. He had been digging at a site of uh, Hatzor. I mentioned that was the main city in the north during Solomon's time, in Joshua's time, too, for that matter. And uh, he, um, he was a conservative. I say he followed the Albright School. I just meant he kind of thought the Bible might know what it's talking about. So this is an interesting thing about his background. Now, he had dug this site in the 1950s. This is the site of Hotsor. It's mentioned many times in the Bible. We say Hazor in English, but it's actually Hotsor. And the uh, ancient Canaanite cities underneath all this area. See the trees over here, this area? If you put a shovel down anywhere in that field, you're going to find archaeological treasures. You're going to find buildings and walls and jewelry and pottery, all sorts of things. It's amazing. Just go down about, um, we say centimeters, but inches. I'd say about six, seven inches, and you start hitting stuff. A foot down, you're finding all sorts of stuff. Amazing place. So he had been digging this site, and particularly he had been working this area where the Acropolis, the upper city, is. And he found something very interesting. And you're going to see that here in just a moment. He found what he believed was a gateway built by King Solomon from the 10th century. That's when Solomon was alive. And he was quite certain that this was a correlation with the biblical text in 1 Kings because Solomon is said to build three cities, Hatzor in the north, Megiddo in the middle, and uh, Gezer in the south. And so when he found this, he was very excited. It's hard to know what you're looking at if you're not trained, but here's a map that makes it a little easier. What he found was a six-chambered gate with two guard towers. Sometimes we call this kind of a gate. It's in white. You can see it on the map here. It's a four-entry gate because there's a doorway here, 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 and here. And the idea of this was, and this can be attributed to the wisdom of Solomon, if you have only one door on your city, it's easy for the guys to come along that don't like you and bash it down with a battering ram. Then they're inside your city. Okay, but if you have two doors, it's two, twice as much work. 
he decided to make four doors, four gates, and in each gate he had a little welcoming committee waiting for the enemy and these little guard rooms. So you broke through one door, there's a bunch of soldiers to meet you. You break through the next one, there's more soldiers to meet you and so forth. So it made it very hard to break into this city. In addition to that, in Solomon's time, he had the walls made double thick. He decided to make the walls four times thicker than normal walls. He made them empty, and he used them for storerooms when things were peaceful. But if the enemy came, he could fill those rooms up and have a super thick wall. These are called casemate walls, walls with rooms inside. This is an innovation that's attributed to Solomon's time. Okay, so now I often stop my students. Now you learn what we're looking at here. We're going to look for, when we get to Megiddo and we, uh, get to Gezer, we're going to look for Solomonic gateways with six rooms and four doorways and casemate walls. Does that make sense? Okay, so you know, you're already halfway to becoming a professional archaeologist. I'll give you a couple more things to look for, and then you'll be all ready to go, and I'll take you on the plane on the dig, okay? So you have to look for these kinds of architectural elements. You'll see that in different colors as other buildings. They're from different time periods. And if you're in a real archaeological class, I'd have to explain to you what all those things mean. But we're going to skip that today and just focus on what the white building is. So he noticed, Yadin noticed that the second city in the Bible was which one? It was Hatsa first. Then what was number two? It's on the screen in case, you know. I always put the, I tell my students when you take a test, always look at the whole test because the answer is in another question somewhere. So or you look at the picture, somewhere the answer is hidden up there. Just open your eyes, you'll see the answer. This is Megiddo. Megiddo was dug before the time of Yagil Yadin. It was dug by the University, University of Chicago, back uh, before World War II, 1920s. And they excavated this big round site. This is on the edge of the Megiddo Valley, the Valley of Armageddon, if you will. Armageddon, by the way, comes from two Hebrew words, Har for mountain and Megiddo for the name of the city. So Ar Megiddo is kind of a Greek corruption of the mountain of Megiddo, which was the name, this city is built right below a mountain, okay? So the uh, University of Chicago was excavating this, and uh, here's a more recent aerial photograph, and what they found was, again, a gateway uh, with these rooms, one room here, one room here, one room there, and the same thing on the other side. Six total rooms, does that ring any bells? Yadin found that in um, his digs in the 1950s at Hotzer. Now, these guys at Chicago dug this earlier, but they had no idea what they found in terms of the Solomonic connection. They did find a six-chambered gate, though, and it matched perfectly. Plus, next to the gate was a six-chambered, I'm sorry, a casemate wall. So same kind of wall as Hotzer, the same kind of gateway as Hotzer. So Yadin started getting excited. He found same architecture in both sites, okay? And he dated it to the 10th century. Um, something else that I want to highlight here while we're moving along, since this is a semi-archaeological class, if you do well enough, we'll entertain your application to go on a dig, okay? Uh, notice these stones here. These stones are what are called ashlar stones. In archaeology, an ashlar stone is one that's squared off on all six of its surfaces, like a brick, okay? In previous times, they would build walls by just using round rocks and stacking them up on top of each other. And then they'd put, where it's a little bit loose and rolly, they'd put little chink stones in to make the wall stick together. That wasn't a real good way of building a wall. It was easy to knock it over. But around the time of Solomon, somebody came up with the idea of using square stones for important buildings, and they were a lot harder to knock the wall down. And these ashlar stones, it turns out they were invented by the Phoenicians. Now, why is that interesting? Well, King Solomon, when he started rebuilding his empire, Hatzor, Megiddo, and Gezer, plus Jerusalem, he did not have enough skilled workers in Israel to do the work. They weren't trained to do that. So what did he do? Well, he had a buddy king, a neighboring king in today's Lebanon. In Phoenicia, it was called then Syria and Lebanon today. And this guy's name was Hiram of Tyre. His capital city was, uh, was at Tyre, a coastland city north of Israel. So Solomon said, I'll tell you what, I'm going to give you a bunch of cities for free in the northern part of Israel if you'll send some workmen down and build these nice cities for me because your Phoenician guys are much better trained and they know how to build. And they knew how to make these ashlar stones. And that's what we find here. If you look closely, these are all square ashlar stones. These all date to the 10th century as well. So, that, as well. so that's another indicator we're dealing in the time of Solomon. This is important. This is my professor Deaver when he was a young man. He's visiting Megiddo, and these are the Asher stones. The rooms are filled in with regular round stones, but the Asher stones are at the pylons and at the corners. So this is very important for dating things to the time of Solomon. Now, we finally come to Gezer, where I would get to dig in 1990. 
Um, the first person to dig at Gezer was a British guy named Robert Armstrong Stuart McAllister. If you're British, you have to have at least three names in front of your last name. If you're an American, you only get two. So he was a, a well-known scholar from that time. He dug there in 1902, and uh, he didn't know much about scientific digging. He was just looking for big buildings and treasure. He pitched a tent, hired about 200 Arab workers, and he would dig a big trench across the site. Then he'd dig a second trench next to the first trench and take all the dirt from the second trench and bury the first trench. So he was kind of destroying the stratigraphy and these six, you know, 26 layers of cities by mixing it all up like a fruit salad, you know, just toss out, mixing it all up. He did find a few important things. Here's a picture of R.A.S. McAllister. One of the things that he found, and he published this in his book about 1904 or thereabouts, he found an interesting wall with rooms in them. See these rooms? You have to remember we've got several different layers of cities superimposed upon each other. But he found these rooms. What does that look like to you? Casemate walls, like Solomon built at Hatsor and also at Megiddo. This was at Gezer, but it was done before my professor got there to dig. And Yadin was looking at this plan. Then he noticed this structure here. There's a building underneath it from a different level. But he said, now this is interesting. This is a doorway. And then we have one room here. There's something blocking part of the room. Another room here and another room there. That's three rooms if you have good eyes looking at this old plan. Now, McAllister, when he found this, he didn't know what he was digging. He didn't know how to date it. He didn't know his pottery and other things. So he said it was a Maccabean castle. Well, what's a Maccabean castle? Well, about 200 years before the time of Jesus, a bunch of Jews revolted against the Greeks, particularly a Greek king called Antiochus Epiphanes. Some of you are Adventists, you might recognize that name. That's another story. But uh, this McAllister thought that this was built by the Jews during the time of the Hasmonean Maccabean revolt against the Greeks. He's only off by over 1,000 years, <laughs> almost 1,500 years. But he published it that way. So Yadin saw this. He said, wow, that looks like it's a King Solomon casemate wall and a six-chambered gate, but half the gate's missing. So he called up Bill Deaver, my professor, and he said, I would like to show you this map. And he said, look at this map. Here's my professor, Deaver. I got all these pictures from him when I was a student. Bill gave me copies of all these historic pictures. And these are all famous archaeologists of the time. I won't go through them. They're all very famous. Here's Yadin right here, the man with the pipe. And he told Bill Deaver, he said, if you will dig in this place at Gezer, you're, gonna find, you're going to find the other half of a six-chambered gate, and that dates to King Solomon. And you'll find the casemate wall. Now, what would you do if you're a young archaeologist and you're told, you know, X marks the spot, dig here, and you're going to find something. That doesn't happen very often in archaeology. But Deaver uh, took Yadin's word for it, and he did the excavation in the very spot. Yadin told him to look, and here's what he found, the six-chamber gate. Here is what McAllister found before World War I in the 1960s. This is what Deaver found. And here you can see the rooms, one, two, and three. One, two, and three. Here's the main gate. People ask, what's this trench here? Originally, that was covered by the street flagstones, but it's the sewer system that runs out the front gate. That's all that is. So they excavated that. The gate went right through here. Something else that's an interesting side light. See these stones like this person sitting on here inside the rooms? That's where the soldiers would sit when they're waiting for the enemy to come. Or the Old Testament says that when you wanted to have a contract witness, some important business deal, you would go to the elders who sat in the city gates. And a lot of people wondered, oh, how do you sit in a gate? Well, they sat on these stone benches around the inside of the gate. We've found archaeologically this happens all the time in Old Testament cities. They all have these benches around. So the Bible writer knew what they were talking about. Yeah, the old men would go there, hang out in the city gate. That's where everybody would come and go. They could see what was happening in the city. And if you wanted to have a contract witness, you'd go to one of these respected older men, and you'd have him sign or uh, indicate that he was a witness to the contract. So these little details all suddenly pop up as being true details written by whoever wrote the Bible, somebody who knew what they were talking about. So this is a slide from Bill Deaver's collection showing in color the gateway as he found it in the 1960s. So, and then he completed the plan. This is a, now this is a palace of Solomon off to the left, and then this is the gateway that Solomon built, hooked into the casemate ru uh, rooms, and you can see all of the chambers and the four doors, one here, one here, one here, and one here. So Deaver was quite excited about this. He had found a Bible person, at least evidence of the Bible person Solomon's work has testified in the Bible in 1 Kings 9. He was quite proud of that. So when he started being accused of being a 
closet fundamentalist, even though he was proud of being anti-Bible, he was kind of mad. He was caught in the middle because part of the Bible he wanted it to be true, the time of Solomon, part of it he didn't want it to be true. But anyway, we had gotten the money. We decided we'd go back and re-excavate, and that's what we would do. So these are different maps of the gate system, and I won't go through all the details there. Now, this is an important map here because we now want to introduce the second little part of our um, discovery for this summer. Gezer was 26 cities, as I said, buried on top of each other, and so this map represents different phases of some of the 26 cities. Here is the Solomon Gate right here with a casemate wall, but you'll notice unconnected to this is another wall out here and then another wall right here. This is called the inner wall, and this is called the outer wall. These are older than the time of Solomon. You don't have any way of telling that from the map. You'll have to take my word for it. But these were dug by McAllister uh, much earlier, and he did find some very early walls. But nobody was sure how old those walls were. When we got there, they were all underground, of course. You have to dig down to get to them. So we would have to do some excavation. But McAllister had exposed them back before World War I. Now, being good archaeologists, um, what would you think? I don't know if one of these young men want to be brave and tell me. I see a lot of young people here. What are these square bumps in the wall here? You see them? There's round ones here at the corner. What are these square things in the middle of the wall? Anybody have a guess? You can ask your mom or dad if you want to, if you're not quite sure. Did anybody have a guess what those square thickenings of the wall would be? Yeah, go ahead. Absolutely right. This guy goes to the front of the class. These are watchtowers. These are the guard towers put along what was called the curtain wall, the main wall. So we would be looking for watchtowers to know when we're finding the wall. Now, my job was to dig up here looking for Joshua's wall. We thought it would be this outer wall. Deaver was digging in the Solomonic period. Now, Solomon would be over here, too. I'd be looking for both those things, and Deaver would be looking, too. But we split the team in half. He would work here, and I would work here looking for Joshua's wall, while he was looking for Solomon's gateway. That's basically how it boiled down in simple terms. So here's a picture from before World War I of McAllister digging. He found the outer wall. Here's a part of the tower sticking out right there. This would go up much higher, of course. The wall's not at its fall height. The top part would be made out of mud brick, the bottom part stone, because the brick is lighter and it keeps the wall from collapsing. So I was going to have to rediscover this wall by re-excavating this area here, uh, you know, almost a hundred years later. So now here's a reconstruction, and this will help you understand Bible time cities. The bottom part, uh, here's a person for scale uh, model, of course. Here's the gateway here. There'd be four of those gateways. The tower sticks out here. And then the top part of the wall is made out of the mud brick because it's light. And at the very top of the wall, they'd make these little up and down steps. They're actually called battlements or crenellations. It's where the Israelite soldiers could hide behind, you know, and stick their head out, fire an arrow, or throw a rock, or, you know, sling a rock, and then they hide back behind. And then the top towers are even higher. This is how they would defend themselves against the Babylonians or the Assyrians and so forth. Uh, this was a very hot topic. These were some of the publications at the time. Everybody was arguing about whether the Bible was true or not over these stories. And so one of the skeptics was Dr. Israel Finkelstein. I always found this ironic because his name was Israel, but he denied the history of Israel. <laughs> He's a Jewish working in Tel Aviv and uh, a very interesting person. He came at the beginning of our dig when he came. He heard we were going to come and redig Solomon's Gate and show it was the 10th century. He believed that nothing was earlier than the 8th century. He said the stories of David and the stories of Solomon are exaggerations. They are no more historical than King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. This is biblical fiction. He said the real important king was Ahab and Omri, his father, the kings of Israel in the north, much later than Solomon. He said nothing here will date earlier than the 8th century B.C. Solomon's supposed to be the 10th century B.C. That's 200 years earlier. Joshua's supposed to be the 14th century or 15th century B.C. Probably 14th century is the best date. So we're way off by centuries. And so Finkelstein brought his students from Tel Aviv University in Israel. They're all standing around, and this is my professor, and they're telling him, you're wasting your time. There is no Solomon. There is no Joshua. So Israel Finkelstein's the man with the white Gilligan Island beanie cap and the black beard, okay? And I was taking pictures of all this. We visited other professors. This is David Yushishkin, another Israeli scholar. He says the same thing. There's no Solomon. There's no Joshua at Gezer, you're wasting your time. Nothing is earlier than the 8th century. 
So we were visiting with lots of important scholars. Now, this is a young me. You can see how skinny I was in those days. I'm wearing my baseball cap around Gezer, and I was talking to one of the professors that dug with Deaver 20 years earlier, and he was supporting us. Yes, you dig here, you're going to find evidence for Solomon and Joshua. So this is the conversation that I was having with him. You can see I always have my camera. They're ready to take pictures. Someone else shot this one. Another important professor is Larry Steger from Harvard University. He was digging a Philistine site that summer. He found a golden, a golden silver calf in the ruins there. Quite interesting. We hear about the golden calf in the Bible. Of course, he found one that made the cover of a national, I think, Time magazine or news. I can't remember what it was, an archaeology magazine. So he was on our side, too. And uh, so we visited him. He would come back to visit. They all came back to our site at the end of the summer to see what we found. Now, an important detail. This is, again, learning archaeology. How would we know what the pottery would look like from the time of Solomon? Okay, we needed pottery from the 10th century B.C. That's when Solomon was alive. How did we figure that out? So I'm giving you a little bit of archaeological research background. And there was a professor from, um, I'm trying to remember, he got his diploma from Harvard, but we had it at Andrews for a while. A funny story. We had it, and we sent it all back to Harvard. We borrowed material to do research on him, and so we had his stuff for a while. But his name was George Reisner. He's from Indiana, Indianapolis area, and he had dug in Samaria. Now, Samaria is a city in northern Israel. It was the capital of the Israelite kingdom after the time of Solomon. And we know from the Bible that Omri, uh, king of Israel, built that city. Before then, it was owned by a guy named Shemer. And he had a plantation at Samaria, and that's why we call the site of Samaria. Samaria is from Shemer, Samaria. So we knew that he dug there, and so we knew that when <clears throat> Omri builds the city, that would be just after the time of Solomon, because we can date him to 880. That's the 9th century. So any pottery below Omri's pottery would be Solomon pottery. He's 10th century, Omri's 9th century, okay? So we went ahead and looked at the pottery from Samaria. This, these are the ruins of Omri's palace. We knew the date from the Bible, and you can see this big ruin there. I can tell you a lot about this uh, excavation. Very interesting, but we don't have time tonight. But here's the key thing. Under Omri's palace, in the estate of Shemer, who owned the place first, we found special pottery. It looks kind of reddish, and it's got stripes in it. Do you see the stripes in it? It's called burnishing. When they're making the pots, they took a stick and they rubbed it, and they made these kind of funny stripes. This is called by archaeologists red burnished ware and it dates to the time of King Solomon. Very simple, right? So if you're paying attention, you're going to look for that pottery later on as we start digging down. Now, I'm going to get there pretty quick, and we've got to move the story along here. Okay. No, so we show up in 1990 at Gezer. That's me next to my professor, Deaver. I'm the little assistant director. He's the big director. And one of the things we did right off the bat is very unusual. We knew that McAllister had dug the site before World War I, and we didn't want to redig meters of his debris. So we took a tractor, a front loader, and scraped off all the stuff he did so we could quickly get down to the lower levels that were still pure, so as to speak. And so we could start the excavation without going through several weeks. We didn't want to waste our $40,000 digging through someone else's garbage heap. So we brought a tractor on the site. Oh, something happened before that. I forgot this was in the story. The very first weekend when we all arrived in Israel at Jerusalem, we were going to start digging on Gezer, at Gezer on Monday. Uh, we arrived on Friday, and, uh, of course, half our group were Adventists from Andrews University, so on Sabbath, I took all the students around Jerusalem, and they'd never been there before, most of them, so I showed them all the famous places of Jerusalem where Jesus was crucified, where he was buried, resurrected, things from the prophets, the Old Testament, the walls of Solomon's temple in Jerusalem, all of that, so we did a lot of looking around on Sabbath. When uh, Sabbath was done... Uh, everybody was hot and tired. It was warm in Jerusalem, summertime. It was June. And so they said, can we get some ice cream uh, after sundown? Uh, the Jews in Israel are kind of like Adventists. You know, for those of you who know, are visiting us, Adventists keep Sabbath. And so we don't do work uh, between Friday night and Saturday night. Uh, we, we can walk around and look at things and study and so forth, but we don't really do excavation. And, but it was hot walking around on Sabbath, so when in the sundown, the Jews opened up all their stores on uh, Saturday night, and the ice cream stores are open as well, and so they said, can we go over to the Jewish half of the city and buy ice cream, because it's hot, and it'd be a nice treat, so I said, okay, 
Now, uh, you need to understand something else. Uh, this has nothing to do with the dig, but we bought two vans. You can see this one's burnt. We bought two brand new vans, rented them actually, on Friday. These were going to be used by our excavation team. Brand new. They'd never been driven before. They still had the new car smell, okay? And so we drove them around uh, on Friday and then a little bit on Sabbath, but we mostly walked. To keep the van safe, we have an Adventist center in Jerusalem. You folks were there, but it's all fixed up since this happened. So it uh, had a uh, seven-foot whoops wall around it right here, and on top of that was another six-foot steel picket fence. That was to keep the Palestinians out because the year we were doing this dig in 1990 was one of the years of the Intifada. This is the revolt of the Arab Palestinians against the Jews and their control of Palestine. They have an ongoing battle there. And what the Arabs were doing that summer was if you had an Israeli car, and you could tell an Israeli car because it had a yellow license plate on it, Arab cars had blue license plates. So if you took your yellow license plate car into the east part of Jerusalem where the Arabs lived, and they saw it parked on the street, they would set fire to it, blow it up, okay? Well, we knew this. Our Adventist center was on the east side of Jerusalem, but we had no place to park the car. But we thought there's a great big metal door right here. You can see it. And there's this stone wall and this brick. We thought it'll be safe inside. And so we had gone for our uh, ice cream on Saturday night. The Palestinian boys that lived uh, next to us, they saw us leave, and they knew we had those two Israeli vans inside the Adventist compound. So we go off. We were gone about 45 minutes. We buy our ice cream. We come back walking down the street above the Adventist Center. We saw smoke and fire pouring out of the Adventist Center. And I saw the red lights of the fire department of Israel, and I saw the blue lights of the Israeli police. So we ran down there to see what was happening. We found out that the Palestinians had climbed over the wall, over the picket fence. They had a five-gallon car, a jerry can of fuel. They poured it all over our brand-new van. That was white originally. And they set a match to it, and the whole thing just blew up. Now, there's another part of this story I have to tell you. When I took all the students to go get ice cream, I had one guy named Ralph. He's about six foot six tall and about six foot six wide. Very big guy. And he was dead tired from all the hiking. And he said, I don't want to get ice cream. You know, I need to lose weight. I don't want to do that. I'm going to go sleep in my bed in the center. The rest of you go get ice cream. And I insisted that he come. And he got mad at me. I don't want to go. I said, yes, stay with the group. You must come. No, yes. So he came very upset with me. When we saw the blown up van, we saw the whole front of the Adventist Center was uh, burnt and the wind was blowing. Tony and I went inside to see where the students were staying. Some student had put their bed right up against the window. It turned out to be Ralph's. He would have stayed in that bed and taken his mat. When the explosion happened, uh, the bed was shredded from the shrapnel and the glass. He would have been seriously injured if not killed outright. So we have come to the conclusion that it's very good after Sabbath to eat ice cream because it may save your life. So this has become a mantra with us for our, our projects. Anyway, you can see our van was destroyed. We had to go back Sunday. All we had were the keys, and uh, they gave us a new van. But they said, please don't drive on the east side of uh, Jerusalem anymore. So we, here's our team. It's uh, uh, Andrews University students in the University of Arizona. Here's myself and my professor, and we start our dig. First thing we had to do was to clear the weeds away. This is from the 1960 dig. It had all grown up with weeds. You can see we're walking around there, and the six-chambered gate is buried, and the Solomonic Palace all buried. We cleaned it and got all the weeds out, so you can see how nice it looks now. And so we were going to dig in two places, in between the gatehouse and the palace, right along here. We had to get below the walls and see if we could find evidence of Pharaoh's burning. We want to see the evidence for Solomon's construction, and then the evidence for uh, Pharaoh's burning. These were simple things to look for. Red burnished pottery would be found there too, if we're right. So here's uh, here's the gate after we cleaned it. Here's Dr. Deaver. We're in the here's the gatehouse and the palace of Solomon, and we're in the walkway in between. These are some of the students we brought with us, and we started excavating below these walls down here to get below the floors to get underneath to see the foundations and the pottery and see if we could date this to the Egyptian attacks and the Solomonic rebuilding. So and here's what we found. The first thing we found actually was before, after Solomon, I'm sorry, we saw black soil with ash, charcoal sticking out. This, we tur it turned out that after Solomon was died in the time of Rehoboam, the uh, king of Judah after his father Solomon died, the Bible says that a pharaoh named Shishank or Shishak or Shishak came to Gezer and attacked it and burned it. We'd forgotten about that, but that's in the Bible too. 
we found Shishak's destruction dating to after the time of Solomon. That was interesting. That was something we weren't expecting. We went deeper underneath Shishak's destruction, and we found the foundation for Solomon's palace and his gateways down here. He made a whole system of tic-tac-toe latest structure to make a strong foundation for the gate. And in here, we started looking at the pottery, and it was all this kind of red burnished pottery. It was all 10th century, so perfect dating. Okay, in fact, the pottery I showed you was actually our Roman pottery. We had different pottery from Samaria. So we were excited. We had 10th century construction, uh, and then an Egyptian destruction. Now, underneath this, we should find the first pharaoh. Turns out his name was Siamun, who gave his daughter to Solomon to marry. And so we went down even earlier, and here's Solomon's stones, the bottom stones, and the soil turned black again. We found another burn layer. So we had burn layer. It's time to quit. I'm not using my microphone. I have such a loud voice, I forget about that. Thanks. So we found a burn layer from uh, Siamun, from Solomon's time. Solomon's building, and then the post-Solomon destruction. Just perfect. Bang, bang, bang. The pottery lined up perfectly. And we actually have uh, an inscription in the time of uh, Shishak talking about his attack towards Palestine. Now, the final part, and I'm coming kind of to the close of our story. What about Joshua? Okay, this was all happening simultaneously, you have to remember. So we didn't know about Solomon's proof and uh, the destruction of the Egyptians until the end of the season. Meanwhile, I was digging on the other side of the site. This is Ralph, my big guy, whose life was saved by eating ice cream after Sabbath. And here's our tractor. We plowed away uh, the dirt from McAllister's dig. We found the top of the outer wall, and we started excavating. Now, here's the wall. There's this piece sticking out. That might be a watchtower that some of you guys saw, right? Here's the watchtower. But when I got down to the bottom of the wall, the pottery only dated to the time of the Byzantine period. That's Jesus, after Jesus. Nowhere near the 8th century or the 10th century of Solomon, Omri, Solomon, or Joshua. Way off. So what's going on? So as I looked at this, here's the bedrock. I realized that there's something wrong with the wall. They're not bounded right. The stones are square like ashlers from the 10th century, but they were not built uh, in overlapping fashion. You'll see that more in a moment. So I said this section of the wall was rebuilt in the Byzantine period after Jesus. It has nothing to do with Solomon or uh, Joshua. But other parts of the wall might, because sometimes you destroy part of the wall and the other part's still standing. We did find one section of wall with beautiful ashlers. We thought maybe Solomon's wall's at the bottom of this. We started digging down, and the pottery went from the 7th century B.C., time of King Hezekiah, 8th century B.C., the time of Omri and uh, Ahab. And, uh, but the, I had a young lady digging here, and she was very, very slow. We only had six weeks. And I was afraid she would not get to the bottom of the wall by the sixth week. And so I decided to have her just dig in this corner here. Because if you dig less, you go deeper. And so we, uh, we found some stones from the 8th century destruction of the Assyrians mentioned in the Bible. Here the stones are toppled over. But we had to go below that to get earlier in the 8th century. Finkelstein said nothing before the 8th century. And we wanted to prove him wrong. So I put her over here in the corner. And I had her dig just this area, and she kept digging and digging, and the time was going by. We got to week five, week six. We would lower water to her down a rope. We would give her food. We kept her down there. As far as I know, she's still there. She never got to the <laughs> bottom of the wall. So I realized I would have to dig a couple more probes because she was going too slow. So I had some other archaeologists, another lady. She dug another wall. Here's the tower sticking out. And she dug down. She got to the bottom, but it was 8th century, not 10th century to Solomon's time, not 14th century Joshua. We did find something interesting, though. Uh, we discovered uh, this is the foundation trench right here, 8th century. Notice the cracks in the walls, and there are, all the stones are offline. They're all leaning to the left. Well, I told Dr. Deaver, the, I didn't say this part, but I said this was destroyed by an 8th century earthquake. The wall dates to the 8th century. This isn't Solomon's wall. And it isn't Joshua's wall, but the wall was destroyed by uh, an earthquake in the 8th century. I grew up in California, so I know earthquakes. So he said, you're trying to be a biblical archaeologist, Randy. I said, what do you mean? He says, you know that the Bible says in the time of the prophet Amos, there was an earthquake that shook the whole land. And you're trying to tell me you found Amos's earthquake. And I said, no, I'm not. I'm just saying there's an earthquake, and it happens to be the 8th century. You're the one that said it's Amos's earthquake. And he said, I don't believe it. He said, I think that... Uh, you're making this up. You know, it says there's no evidence for earthquake activity here. Well, while we were having this friendly argument, one of the other doctoral students 
heard Dr. Deaver say there's no evidence for earthquakes, so he went up to Hebrew University to the library, geology section. He looked at the evidence for earthquakes in the history of Israel, and it turns out there was an earthquake in the 8th century based on geological evidence. So he came back and told Dr. Deaver that, and Dr. Deaver said, ah, oh, I can't believe that. You know, we're proving the Bible. He said, I'll tell you what, there's famous professor... Stager from Harvard University is coming in a couple of days. You share with him all of your evidence for the 8th century earthquake and see what he says. Don't say anything about Amos, though. So that's exactly what I did. Here's the evidence. The walls tumbled down, cracks in the stones, like here. This foundation stone is split, and the stones are all turned over. The walls all tilted to the north, meaning the earthquake came from this direction. So Dr. Stager came, and I explained all this evidence to him and the dating of the pottery. I had my camera ready. And after I explained the evidence for the 8th century earthquake, he turned around to Dr. Deaver, who's standing here with his hands on his hips, and Dr. Steger held his hand out, and he said, You know, Bill, I think I remember something in the Bible. Uh, Prophet Amos, I think it was. There was an earthquake that destroyed the whole land in uh, the 8th century. And he had his hand out. He's saying that. I took a picture at that moment, and Bill Deaver sputtered. He said, Well, you said it, not me. Uh, okay, you're, you're the one that's saying that the Bible has been proven here. And, but he took that seriously, and he went back and published an article. Bill Deaver published an article saying a case study in biblical archaeology, the earthquake of Amos in the 8th century. I got a footnote credit for the idea. <laughs> That's how it works when you're in graduate school. Now, that was exciting, but we still, and I'm coming to the close of our little story here, we still hadn't found evidence for Solomon or for Joshua. So we did one more probe, and we did uh, dig on the inside of another section of the wall. This section of wall dated to the 7th century, and it was built on an older wall. So we got excited. Maybe it goes down to the 10th and 14th century. We started digging down, and it quit at the 8th century again. We couldn't get past the 8th century, and that's what Finkelstein had said all along. So Bill Deaver says, I don't know what to do. We're running out of time. So I said, let's go to the outside of the wall and dig down deeper, and that's what we did. We brought the front loader back, cleared the dirt up against the wall, and then we started digging by hand. Here's Dr. Deaver. We're going down the stone, 7th century, 8th century. We're cleaning it by hand, and then suddenly the 8th century wall stopped again. We found a white line where this yellow arrow is, and no more wall. 8th century, what's going on? Where's the Solomon wall? Where's the, uh, where's the um, Joshua wall? And I had this funny remembrance of when I was in Sabbath school. The wise man builds his house upon the rock, and the foolish man builds his house upon the sand. And I said, nobody builds a city wall just on soft dirt. I said, there's got to be another wall. They must be out of alignment. And if we dig deeper, we'll find the other wall. He said, well, we have nothing to lose. In fact, he made a joke. He says, if you believe in Asherah, you know, the pagan gods, you pray to her. If you believe in Yahweh, you better pray to him because we're not finding anything. He made that joke. Well, my guys were taking it seriously. They actually prayed. And we went back, and here's what we found. We dug below. Here's that white line. Here's that white line. There was another wall down there. That shocked everybody. And we started collecting the pottery, 7th century, 8th century. Down here it went 9th century, 10th century, 11th century, 12th century, 13th century, 14th century, all the way down to the time of Joshua. And Deaver was so excited he could hardly contain himself. There's Dr. Mike Hosel from Southern Adventist University. And uh, here's De uh, Deaver making measurements in the stratigraphy. And we were reading the pottery. And we found like 27 buckets of stuff from the time of Joshua, pottery, cooking pots from the time of Joshua. So this was extremely exciting. You can't imagine how excited we were. Well, Finkelstein came back six weeks later to see how we were doing, and Bill Deaver being the usual uh, ham, if you will, sort of an actor, I had my camera ready, and Bill took him to my first square and said, you can see Randy dug down here, and only goes to the third and beginning period. And he went over here, and he only got to the eighth century period, and that's as deep as he could go. And Finkelstein was smiling and saying, I told you so, there's nothing earlier than the 8th century. And then Dr. Deaver said, oh, there's one more thing I want to show you. We did one final square. My causal had covered the lower wall with a curtain. And so when he first got there, he saw only the 8th century wall. And then on Bill Deaver's signal, my causal removed the curtain. And this was Finkelstein's reaction. <laughs> Suddenly there's another wall that's not supposed to be there. And Bill jumps in and explains the pottery sequence that it dated all the way back down to the 14th century. This did not make Finkelstein very happy, and it's led to increased controversy and arguments and letters and uh, articles being written back and forth. But on the whole, we're winning the argument, and that would take a while to explain that. We had all these famous archaeologists, I get from Jerusalem Center, Amahim Azar from Hebrew University, Kudu Dotan, Philistine expert. They all came to look at what we found that summer. Here's uh, Benjamin Mazar. Bill Deaver. This is Larry Stager that we had seen earlier. These are all famous archaeologists. Here's our curtain, by the way, up here. I have another picture with the camera, but I forgot to include that. And here's Dr. Hosel, not wearing a shirt. 
And uh, since then, they've done excavation this way, and everything we found at Sunday has been proven to be true. So we feel very, this is just one little example of biblical archaeology where the stakes were high, everybody was very interested, and how through careful digging and dating the pottery and uh, keeping the biblical text in mind, we were able to show that the Bible writers knew what they were talking about. So uh, some of my colleagues that were with me are continuing to dig Steve Ortiz and others. I'll conclude with this, kind of a nice little story. What about that van that got blown up? This is kind of my last picture here, I think. Um, we had something funny happen during the course of the dig. We had a young couple that wanted to join our dig. They're not Christians. But uh, they were thinking about becoming Christians. And they told me they were going to come to the dig and could I arrange married housing for them. So I gave them a cabin for themselves. Uh, when we started the project, I realized after a couple of weeks that they hadn't bothered to get around to get married yet. <laughs> so I said, what happened? And they said, well, we were going to get married before we came. We're not trying to deceive you, but we've been thinking about Christianity, and we thought it would be cool to be married in Jerusalem. You're talking about being baptized in the Jordan River. They wanted to be married in Jerusalem, so they held off. They said that once we got here, we didn't know how to get married. You, know, you don't just go into an Israeli government uh, ministry and say, I want to get married. I'm a Christian, but they're Jewish. You know? And so you have to have your own minister. So they said, we haven't figured out what to do. Well, of course, we had an Adventist minister with us, my colleague, Dave Merlin as an ordained minister. He said, I'll tell you what, uh, we'll, I'll marry you. You have to get ratified back in the States when you go back in the country, but I can give you a, a wedding. Where would you like to be married? And they said, we want to be married on the east side of Jerusalem, <laughs> on the Mount of Olives. That's in the Palestinian section where they had blown up our van at the beginning of the dig. And the uh, car owner said, don't go back to that side of the city. But they said, we want to get married on the Mount of Olives so we can look down on the old city. So I said, okay, let me see what I can do. So I went back to the Adventist Center. I talked to the old Arab who lived across the street. He knew what had happened when all our vans got blown up, two vans actually. And I went into a shop and he recognized me. I said, I've got a problem. He said, I keep forgetting this, sorry, Denzel. <laughs> I've got a problem. He said, what's your problem? I said, I have two young people that want to get married. He says, that's not a problem. That's wonderful. What's the problem? I said, the problem is they want to be married in East Jerusalem on the Mount of Olives. That's your side of the city. And he got this funny look on his face. I said, last time I was here, you blew up two of my vans. And he said, nothing personal, just politics. <laughs> and I said, but what do I do? Because, you know, the only way we can get over there is to drive. We have a new van, and I promised we wouldn't have another van blown up. And he says, you want to bring your van to the Palestinian side, and you want to have a wedding. And I said, yes. He said, okay, I'll tell you what. You bring your vans here down at the end of the street. I'm going to have some of my boys waiting for you. When I used to say boys are young men. He says, you give the keys to your vans to them. They will protect your vans. And then you can go up to the Mount of Olives and have your wedding. And I was thinking, do I trust this guy? <laughs> I'm just handing him my keys and will he protect them? So we came up on the wedding day. This was at the end of the dig. And there was a nice place on the top of the Mount of Olives we were going to have where you could see the whole old city down below you. So the Palestinian young men were waiting for me at the end of the street where the Adventist Center was still recovering from the burning. And they were waiting. They were smiling. I drive up there. We get everybody unloaded. And I hand them the keys to my car. They wave goodbye and drive off with my vans. And then we walk a little further down to the valley that then turns up towards the Mount of Olives. And there were more Palestinian young men waiting for us down at the bottom of the valley. And I thought, what are these guys all about? What do they want? And they were all smiling. And they parted. And we saw a donkey was waiting there. And they said, put the bride on the donkey. They brought out instruments. They started playing wedding, playing wedding music. And we did a regular uh, trip up the Mount of Olives to wedding music. They brought out pastries and cookies and cake and all of that. And then we had the sermon on top. This is uh, my colleague here. I'm the best man behind. And they got married there. And Dave Merling reminded them that the, a marriage ceremony is like building a wall around your relationship, like the old walls of Jerusalem. We could look right down on the old city walls of Jerusalem. It says, if you will honor that, God will protect you just like those walls protect Jerusalem. They never forgot that sermon, and I think it made a major impact. I got a letter from them uh, some months later. They had their first baby, and they say, we will never forget we were married by a Christian minister in Jerusalem. This was so special for us, so it set their life off, I think, on a good path. So that was the end of that first dig. It's sort of a rather exciting, an unusual dig in some respects, but very affirming that working there with all that attention, uh, working scientifically, carefully with some of the best scholars, we were able to show a great correlation between what the Bible says and archaeological uh, remains that fit chronologically perfectly in with the Bible story. And this is an example of how biblical archaeology can work. So forgive me, I'm a little tired tonight from my travel, but uh, tomorrow we'll be sharing with you a few other.
discoveries, not quite as long as this one, but equally exciting, I think. And then at the key time, I guess 11 o'clock, we're going to show you about our most recent work on Mount Ararat. You've heard a little hint of that, but you're actually going to see both pictures and video of what we're doing up there, and we're going back in two weeks. So if you come back tomorrow, I will be happy to share some of that exciting material as well. So with that, I'm going to close, and uh, Denzel, I don't know if you have a closing prayer. And tomorrow, by the way, uh, it's late tonight, but if you have any questions either about this or archaeology in general, we'll find time tomorrow we can actually tell you what it's like to be a field archaeologist. Thank you, Dr. Yonker. Isn't that exciting?